Well, um, I've been reading this just to, you know, prepare for our conversation right here. And it, it starts, like I said, if you believe in the existence of God, the ideas of a miracle yeah. are, are not difficult, okay? Right. And what's interesting, what I thought was, was fun, Eric, the way you started this book, almost from a very intellectual, you didn't mean to argue for the existence of God to begin with, right. but you looked at the miracle of creation, the fine-tuning of the universe. So spend some time, yeah. just very quickly, let's yeah. spend five minutes yeah. on this yeah. one, yeah. talking about the miracle of creation, yeah. how that's an evidence for God, yeah. and, and how it makes the rest of the miracles possible. Because if God is there, yeah. he can do what he wants. There. Dreams, songs... This is, I mean, this is one of these things that I totally did not anticipate putting in this book. I have to be honest. And that's one of the cool things about writing is that, you know, you start out and, and, and stuff happens. You always, you, you hear about this when you talk, you know, writers tell you that, uh, that the writing takes on a life of its own. And most people here don't know that Huck Finn, uh, when Mark Twain started writing that, it was supposed to be a, a kid's book about a unicorn. Th I didn't know that. That's, that's a lie. I just made that up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But this book, I started writing it, and I said, okay, first thing I need to do is, is sort of define what is a miracle. What do we mean by miracle? And so the first thing I said is, like, a miracle is like the parting of the Red Sea, or if you pray for a blind person and they get their sight. Or we know pretty much what a miracle is, and we shouldn't be so sloppy that we say, oh, everything's a miracle, or, you know, every little coincidence is a miracle. We need to be careful about that, right? So a miracle needs to be when you see God act in a, in a huge way, and you just say, wow. That's, that's a miracle. And I said, because people in this day and age always say stuff like, oh, life is a miracle. And I said, we're not talking about that kind of like it becomes a cliche, life is a miracle. But if you think about it in the right way, <laughs> life is a miracle. And I said, let me talk about that. Let me break that down. And so I talked about what is called the fine-tuned universe. Some of you have heard about this. I know in Dallas you're way more up on this. Anybody in New York if they hear about this in New York, they move to Dallas pretty much. So, but, but the fine-tuned universe is the idea, and this is from science, okay? This is not theological. This is science. Scientists say that the more we know about the natural world, the more freaky it is that we're here, right? Like they say that the odds of life existing on a planet like this are at this point like zero, okay? Because they say you need... The planet needs to be about this size. It needs to be this far away from the star. It needs to be... It, there, there are all these factors, which I didn't know anything about. And so I've, over the years, I've read some books. Hugh Ross, I remember like 20-something years ago, I read this book by Hugh Ross. He talked about this. He's a Caltech astrophysicist. He's a Christian. He wrote about this. And then John Lennox has written about... A lot of people have written about this. And I started looking into it, and you start realizing that it doesn't make sense. If you, if you look at it from a scientific point of view... The odds of life existing on a planet anywhere in the universe are now not just zero, but infinitely below zero, like, like 10 to the 70th power kind of thing. Like absolutely, it, it's, it's frightening. In, in, in other words, to give you, just to give you an example, right? Um, if the Earth were any bigger, the gravity would be bigger, I mean, the gravity would be stronger. And if the gravity were stronger on this planet, it would pull in, it would have the strength to pull in ammonia and methane gas, which are poison. So we would, if you're breathing that, you're dead. So you're not breathing it. And so basically, I thought, that's freaky. So if the Earth were just like 4% bigger, our atmosphere could, would be, un, we wouldn't be able to breathe. If, our, if the world were a tiny bit smaller, the Earth it would not have the gravity to keep in oxygen. That would dissipate into the atmosphere. And so we can, so you start thinking like, that's one parameter. And like in 1966, when Carl Sagan said, oh yeah, there's like, you know, 10 million planets in the universe that could support life potentially. Well, yeah, in 1966, there were two of these kind of parameters, but every year scientists discovered more and more and more and more until like in 2001, there were 150 parameters that scientists say must be met for life to be possible on a planet. And when you add all those up and do the math, you say, well, there's not an infinite number of potential planets. There's a fixed number. And you start realizing like, the odds are not just like, it's not one in 10, one in a billion, one. It, it's a number that when you read it, and it's, it's in the book, but it frightens you. It says the odds from a scientific point of view that there should be life on one planet are 
way below zero. Mathematically, scientifically, life should not exist. So what's the takeaway? Well, it seems obvious. Either our existence is the most freaky, mind-blowing, sick coincidence in the history of coincidences. Now, if you believe that, that, that's what is called faith. If you believe that, you have way more faith than somebody who believes that God created the universe. It's it's way, argument, way more faith. It's a cosmological argument for the existence of God. It's, it's, the, it's what our, our good friends, Steve Meyer and others, you go. In, the, in the science of yeah. the cell... Uh, and all the, not the science, but the, uh, the, oh, the cell. The cell. Um, signature. Signature of the yeah, cell. Yeah. And, and just how we keep seeing order and design as you go down, as yeah. you go out. And so what, what, what you're making a case from early in the book is that, listen, to believe that there's not a God. And I love to tell people this, because science always seems to intimidate Christians. Yeah. There's, but, there's a whole chapter on that, too. I'm not going to go into it. But it's ridic- science and faith are, to say they're not compatible is ridiculous. That's right. You know, it's scientism, totally ridiculous. which is a philosophy and faith are not compatible. Scientism, that's the word. Somebody, okay, so just to to wrap up what what I was saying, so the idea that the universe exists, there's a whole chapter on the existence of the universe, forget about life, the idea that the universe exists the way it does, I won't go into that, and then there's a chapter on the existence of life. That is a miracle. When you read the chapter, you'll get it, because it takes a while, but that makes the Red Sea look like a joke. Yeah. It makes the parting of the Red Sea look like less than nothing, that, that like a half-asleep four-year-old could pull that off <laughs> compared to... And so w- when you look at that, when you say life is a miracle and you realize that the, that the creation of the world, from a scientific point of view, I want to keep saying that, is so implausible, it should freak you out way more than anything that you ever call a miracle. Well, right? this sets us up. Good. There you go. Because it drives us... It should drive you to belief. Yeah. But our Bible says the reason it does is because people suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Yeah. Okay? The problem is not an informational problem, which really will set us up to something we're going to talk about with miracles. But I, I want just to give them this because I want to equip them, right? Yeah. As a pastor, it's my job. And so when I, I scientism is a philosophy. And, it, and it's, a, it's a philosophy that says, in effect, uh, we rule out the, the, the possibility that anything beyond natural law exists. And that takes okay. a faith statement. I wanna, yeah, I want to underscore that because this is a huge point. This is huge. The, the world of time and space, the natural world that we know about, that we can study through science, okay? That's the material world. That's the natural world. And scientists correctly say through science, through the tools of science, we can examine that world, but we cannot examine anything beyond this world, correct? Science can tell you a lot of things, but it can't tell you how to live It can't tell you about the meaning of life. That's not the role of science. But where you get people who are not scientific, but scientistic, they've made an idol and an ideology of this materialist view. They say, by definition, nothing can exist beyond this world. Now, here's the problem. With the rules and the tools of science, you can't make that statement. You cannot know via science whether there's anything beyond this world. So to make that statement is itself to be fundamentally unscientific. That's right. So this is hilarious because you have people who have made an idol of science. And, and most scientists, I would say, are not like this. I'm talking about ideolo- ideological people who are scientific scientists, okay, materialistic, naturalistic scientists. They are ironically putting um, all their eggs in this basket, which is totally ideological, which means it is faith. It is not based on fact, because fact leads you to say, at most, we don't know if there's anything beyond this world. In other words, if you want to be totally honest, the best you can do is to say, we don't know. And I would say, to back up what you said after that, is that in fact, you can say we don't know, or you can say everything we do know points us, yes. leads us in the direction to believe that maybe, in fact, probably, there is something beyond this world. And the, but the problem is if you don't want to believe that, and, if, if, and this is, gets to the point, it's the human will, right? Yeah. In other words, you can have all these facts, and, and, and in the book, I, I, it, it's there. I, I don't know what, what there is to say. Maybe people can quibble, but basically, it's overwhelming so why don't people believe that? Well, because it means I'd have to live differently. You know, I'm cheating on my wife. I'd have to stop that. And, you know, I don't want to stop that because my wife is really grumpy. And, you know, so it's like it keeps me going. So don't, don't, don't put this God stuff on me, right? And I think, okay, so, 
So you're telling me you don't want to believe that, but the facts lead you to believe that. So how do you get out of it? And here's how a lot of people get out of it. And, and of course, I'm, I'm speaking in cartoon ways here. This is not, you know, not everybody, but I'm saying that a lot of people just are uncomfortable with the concept of a creator God. So what do they say? They say, you know what? This universe is so perfectly fine-tuned on this insane level, and how can that be without there being a God? Oh, I got an idea. Let's just say that there's a multiplicity of universes. There's an infinity of universes. We can't see them. We don't know anything about them. But we're just going to say that there's an infinity of universes out there, and we just happen to be living in the one universe where everything worked out perfectly. No joke. This is what some of the finest scientists of our day are saying. That's all they have. And that is infinitely more uh, far-fetched yeah. than saying the God of the Bible created the universe. I mean, that's rather obvious. You know, if you have a choice between the two, it's kind of like choosing the spaghetti monster, the flying spaghetti monster that some of these atheists talk about. I mean, it's so nuts. And I think that part of the reason I wrote this book is I want everybody to understand the facts. Like, so when you're arguing with somebody or you're having a conversation, you don't have to win every conversation, but at least know that what you believe is outrageously rational. It doesn't mean that you're going to force somebody to believe what you believe, but, but let's at least have the same facts so that it doesn't become a, a shouting match. Well, let me say this to you guys, because some of those books are really hard to digest. You've read those books, and you've taken your Yale abilities, yeah. and you've condensed Lennox's book and some of Hugh Ross's observations into one single chapter yeah. that gives them an opportunity to learn this conversational uh, loving technique so that you can help people who pride themselves in intellectually rejecting Christianity on this one point alone, which is the fine-tuning of the universe. And one of the things I just want to add in to is so helpful because people go, well, the Bible's not a science book. And I, I love to respond to that. I go, well, that's a good thing because if it was, it'd have to change every five years because science is constantly changing, okay? Yeah, yeah. And statements that scientists made with absolute authoritative yeah. conviction yeah. have now been proved scientifically to be errant. And so yeah. science That's right. is evolving yeah. as we get better at observing natural law. Right. And all natural law is natural law doesn't cause anything. It is just what is, and it also cannot prevent anything. And that's why when somebody is supra-natural, we have a God of order, so he made things happen in a natural way. Right. But because he's there... And he wants to do something above and beyond natural events, right. he can. Yeah. So now, let's get into some of the stuff, because I'm telling you, just learning that is worth the book. Okay? Well, but, I, I want to thank you for saying that. And I was going to say that part of what I know that I do, because a lot of people say, like, oh, you're so smart, you did all this research. Totally untrue. I, I, I want you to know, I mean, I want to be honest, right? Almost everything that's in this book, not everything, but almost everything... I just got from, from other books. People have written about this and put this in books, but the problem is maybe those books are a little too uh, scientific or a little too hard to get. I, I said, look, some of this stuff everybody needs to know. I mean, truly, everyone. And it doesn't matter if you're a person of faith or not. We all ought to know this stuff because it helps us think about life. And I said, I want to put that in, in my book. And then if, if you like it, it'll lead you to these books that I read. But I, I really do feel it's, it's incredibly important for us to know these basic things. These are basic things, and that's why I put it in there. And